In today's video, what to consider when buying a new piano. Hello and welcome to Making Music. I am Michael and today I'm going to be talking about what I think you should be considering when buying a new piano. Now, this video is not if you're looking to buy a concert grand for the Royal Festival Hall and nor is it a video if you're looking to buy a stage piano for your next gig at Wembley Stadium. Okay, so this is for normal people buying a piano for their homes. Okay, so before we get into it, there's a million and one ways to play music, there's a million and one ways to go about it. Uh, my advice is based on my education, a bachelor's degree from Trinity, master's degree from Royal College, and I've been playing professionally and teaching for over 20 years. If you find something you like, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Leave me a comment, let me know what you think. Please like the video and please subscribe. Okay, so let's get into it. So I'm gonna to talk to you about six key things I think you need to consider. I'm gonna give you a list of essentials and also a top tip at the end. But before we do that, the question that you're probably asking yourself is, though important, probably not quite as important these days as it used to be. So you're probably thinking, do I get an acoustic or do I get a digital? We're not talking electric pianos here. Electric pianos are a completely separate category. They are a a proper analog instrument, uh, such as a Fender Rhodes or what have you, that don't try and replicate the sound of a, a, uh, an acoustic piano, whereas the digital piano try, tries to do that. So that's what we're talking about, the difference between acoustic and digital. And there's co cons, pros and cons to both of them. So with an acoustic, there's nothing beats the, 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 the feeling of playing a big acoustic instrument, especially if you're talking about a grand instrument, uh, a grand piano. Wonderful, wonderful feeling you get from playing those. Same thing with a good acoustic upright. Uh, you, you, you get that vibration from the instrument. Wonderful, wonderful feeling. The draws back with them is obviously they are heavy. Okay, they're heavy. Also, they, depending on the age of the instrument, uh, it might need tuning regularly. Older instruments can sometimes need tuning every six months. I, I had a piano three years <laughs> that's how good it was so it really depends on the quality and depends on the age and sometimes just the, the, the environment that the piano is stored in with a digital one obviously it's not going to have the same uh, vibrations that you would get from an acoustic instrument but it does have other advantages number one you can plug headphones in and you can play at any time okay so that's a, a really big advantage there I know you can get some acoustics where they do have that capability it's not quite the same, but so we're not going to cover it, uh, cover those off. Uh, but that's another option you might want to consider. Um, the other good thing about a digital one is they will often have MIDI capability, which means that you can plug your keyboard, or sorry, your digital piano into a computer, and using a sequencing program, you are able to record directly onto it. Okay, so we have got six things I think you need to consider. The first three are related, and then the, the, the third three are a little bit more practical. So the first thing to consider is who is the instrument for? Is it for Lang Lang, or is it for a four-year-old you're looking to inspire? Big difference here between what you want to do. I'm going to start at this end over here. So for a four-year-old, it's probably still a little bit too young to be to be playing a uh, full piano at that age. Get them a small keyboard if you just want to try and inspire them. Something you're prepared to throw away in about a year's time because they could well bash the living daylights out of this thing. If you, you could even go for a recorder or something of that nature as well, just to make some sound. Um, it, it's good to try and inspire them. Get them to sing more. Get them to listen to music more as well. It is another good thing to do with, with youngsters to try and inspire them. As they get a little bit older, maybe you know, you're talking six, seven, they're a little bit more mature, you can get them a small keyboard. As long as they have the capability to play on a proper piano somewhere else, whether it be at school or at the teacher's house or something, so they get used to having proper weighted keys, okay? And then as the, uh, as the, the child gets older and matures and gets better, you want to consider getting a full-size instrument, um, and I'll give you the list of what you need to consider um, or essentials later on in this video. Okay, the other thing is if the instrument is for you as an adult, consider your goals. Now I've taught a lot of adults in my time um, and I would always start off the lessons by asking them, what are you looking to get out of the lessons? And invariably the, answer, uh, the answers vary a lot obviously, um, but a very common one would be, oh I want to be able to sit down on the piano and play anything. Okay, and what's your time frame for this? 
Oh, about six months. Okay, forget it. Look, you're not in a Hollywood film here. You're not gonna put a montage together of practicing and then suddenly you can play a piano. Ain't gonna happen. Be a bit more realistic, okay? I've met hundreds of top, top players, professors, concert pianists. I can count on one hand the number of people that I've met that are able to sit down at the piano and play anything, okay? So scale it back a little bit. Be a little bit more realistic. Yes, you can be able to play something in six months. I'm not saying you won't be able to. Don't sit down and sit, play anything. Okay, that, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen, okay? So you might wanna consider not splashing out too much on a big instrument if it just ends up becoming uh, another uh, place where you hang your, 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 your laundry, for instance. If you, that's the amount of times I've seen people buying um, exercise bikes and it just ends up being a place where they, they dry their shirts on. You don't want your piano to be some kind of fancy bookshelf, even though it could be a nice piece of furniture, but that's a whole other story, okay? So consider that. You might want to consider buying something a little bit cheaper uh, rather than going full out to begin with. And this brings me on to my second point. You want to consider what is left, right, up, down, backwards and forwards. I hope that's right for your orientation there. Who are you going to be disturbing, okay? Um, have you got neighbours this way, that way? Do you live in an apartment? Do you live in a, a, a detached house where you're not going to be disturbing anybody? Great, get the biggest instrument you can find, knock yourself out. <laughs> However, most of us will probably have someone in the vicinity that might be disturbing. Do you have young kids, for instance? Do they go to bed at seven o'clock and you want to practice between seven and nine? You might want to consider that. Which brings me to onto my third point is, where will you be practicing? Again, with your kids, are you going to be practicing between seven and nine? You might want to have headphones in. The acoustics are probably not going to do that well for you. Do you work at home during the day and you want to practice during your lunch hour? There's nobody around. Doesn't matter too much, then, does it? Okay. Um, do you want to be again going back to the evening? Are you going to be disturbing your partner who's trying to watch television? Which brings me to my next point, which is where do you put the instrument? Do you put it front and center in the house, or do you put it somewhere more private, a bit more secluded? And there's this pros and cons with each one of these. By putting it right in the middle of the, of the, the living space, for instance, you um, are immediately drawn to it. Um, and especially if you've got young kids, they're more likely to go up and try and play it. Um, you might walk past and you say, oh, I've got some music on it. Let me just try that. I'll sometimes just take a book and I'll just flick and I'll leave it there because I know that I'm going to come back to it. So let me just try that little bit there. And you start to, to play it. So that's, that's, that's a plus. Of course, the, the mindset is that when you're practicing, you might be disturbing other people from using that living space. Um, the good thing about having it in a more secluded area is that you uh, can be practice more privately. Um, a lot of times people, they will practice to the, uh, the surrounding. So they almost like, they will start performing. And I'll give you an example. I was lucky enough to go to the City Trinity and to the Royal College and they have beautiful, beautiful buildings. Trinity in Greenwich, the old Royal Naval College and the Royal College uh, just opposite the Royal Albert Hall. And you, you, you arrive and you're almost in awe of these places. And I was guilty of this myself to begin with, uh, but you know you realise actually you, you've got to get down to it. But you start to feel like you're performing all the time because you worry about who might be listening. And the same thing can apply at home. If the, the instrument is always somewhere where people are listening, you might start to always be playing, practice, uh, not, um, uh, be performing rather than actually practicing. Real practice, which I'll do another video on at some point, can actually be really quite boring to listen to. The other thing is consider the, the age of the, the people playing. If they're teenagers, they might be a bit more self-conscious, so maybe that private space might be a bit better. Um, but also, do you want to be playing for people? Then it's not, you know, people are coming up, coming over, oh, let me just take you to my study, we're going to play a little bit. Mm, probably not going to go down quite as well. Okay, so that's another thing to consider. On to my fifth point. And that is consider the space. So you've decided where you're going to put the instrument. Now you need to consider the space. Is it a very large space? Great, you can have a grand piano. Is it a very small space? Then maybe a grand piano might not fit as well because, well, firstly, physically speaking, it's, it might be just simply too big for the space. Um, the other thing is the sound it creates. If it's a very big, uh, big room, you can probably get a brighter instrument. However, if it's a very echoey room, you might want to consider something a little bit more mellow. Okay, so. Uh, the size is going to be important, also the acoustics of the room is going to be important as well. This is more obviously applicable for acoustic instruments, but um, it also applies a little bit, a little bit to the digitals as well. And let me give you an example of, uh, of something which didn't fit in. Now, when I was at Trinity, um, 
actually the first year I was there, he was uh, he was still in Marylebone, and there was the, uh, the the recital space called the Barbarolli Recital Room, I think it was called, or the Barbarolli Room, or something like that. And I think the professors were asked which instrument they should get for this this space here, and they, they tried out loads and loads of pianos, and they decided on this great big Steinway concert grand. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful instrument. Absolutely, I, I love Steinway pianos, by the way. Um, I'm not sponsored by Steinways, but it's Steinway, if you're watching and you want to sponsor me, please do. I'll be very, very grateful to receive. Um, the problem with this piano in this room was there's nothing wrong with the piano, there's nothing wrong with the room, just the two didn't fit together, okay? The instrument was simply too loud, too bright for that space, okay? So if you're listening to a piano recital in this room, uh, it was so echoey you could barely make out the detail of what the player was trying to, to, to convey and also when it was being used to accompany let's say for instance when I was, uh, did a recital on the bassoon um, although the piano had already been moved by that point it was too overpowering you couldn't hear what the bassoon was, was playing okay so it didn't quite fit the space so they ended up moving it across the road to the church across the road where we often would have recitals and also do, um, do uh, rehearsals and they bought another concert grand, this time a Yamaha. Again, another big fan of Yamaha. Again, Yamaha, if you're watching, you want to sponsor me, please, that'd be great. Uh, getting ahead of myself a little bit, I think, there. But anyway, <laughs> so, but the, the thing about this instrument was it's a bit more mellow and it fitted the space a lot, lot better. And now onto my final point, I think you should consider is don't neglect the used instruments okay you could buy a new instrument great that's fantastic however if you are more of a beginner or you the the children that you're buying the instrument for are beginners you might want to consider a second hand and there's lots of really good second hand instruments out there you can purchase a lot of times there are acoustic pianos which are free to a good home somebody may not be playing anymore it's being used as a bookshelf uh, the person who played it has passed on and that that uh, the other spouse wants to give it to somebody where it's actually going to be used. So they, they can often be good. Refurbished ones can often be very good as well. Um, even digital ones. A lot of times people are selling digital ones because they they bought it on the hope that they were going to be able to play anything in six months' time and they realise actually this is more hard work than what they first thought and therefore they, they, lose, um, they lose motivation and they, they end up selling it. Okay, So you can actually pick up some real good bargains that are used. Okay, and that brings me to the must-haves section, and this is probably a little bit more applicable to the digital pianos rather than acoustic, because acoustic pianos will have this as standard, if you like, okay? So you must, must, must get weighted keys, okay? I know I said to begin with, uh, if they're seven years old, they can just get a, a, you know, a reasonable size, uh, cheap keyboard or whatever, but please, 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 if you can get weighted keys, all the better. Make sure they have somewhere where they can actually practice on weighted keys if these keys are not weighted, okay? Um, it must, must be touch sensitive. To be honest with you, I haven't seen a keyboard these days which isn't touch sensitive, uh, or digital piano which isn't touch sensitive, so unlikely that it won't be, but still something to look out for. Um, must have a sustain pedal, or also called a damper pedal. Um, very, very important to have that as well, especially the, the better you get. Um, and if at all possible, get 88 keys. Look, I'm not gonna split hairs about if it's got 85 keys, 84 keys, or however many keys you've got. How many times do you really play those little twinkle twinkle keys right at the top there? Unless you're four years old, at which point they're incredibly amusing, okay? There's very few pieces of music that actually call for those little keys up at the top there. So, something to bear in mind. That, I'm hoping that's for you at the top. Anyway. Okay, so that's the, the, the list of essentials. And then finally, my top tip is, if you can, get your teacher to come with you to try out the instrument, okay? That might not always be possible. If you don't have a teacher, get one, okay? Get a teacher, please. Um, I'll do a whole other video on that at some point, I'm sure, but you're gonna make so much more progress with a teacher because they're able to guide you in the right direction. Imagine if you're completely blindfolded and you're trying to find your way to learn a new instrument, you don't know where you're going. At least if someone grabs your hand and you're still blindfolded, at least they can lead you in the right direction. Right, okay, enough said about that, but get the teacher. If they're able to come with you, brilliant. That's fantastic. I know I went with several of my students and if nothing else, it just gives them that little bit of comfort when they are, they're parting with their money for, for a new instrument. Um, 
And it's not up to the teachers to tell you which instrument you should buy. It's up to them to guide you to, to think about some of those things I've talked to you about today. And that's exactly what I would do. I'd say to you, look, this is where you're gonna put the piano. It's quite an echoey space. You might want to consider something more mellow. Um, let's have a look and see what else there is, etc., etc. Um, I never actually told them which piano to buy, but we did. To be honest, we always came to the same conclusion anyway. So it, was, um, it, it always worked out really well in the end. So that's my top tip for you: get a teacher, or ask them if there's somebody else they know that might be able to come with you. Uh, you might need to pay them for their time, but it's well worth it if you're spending a lot of money on an instrument. Okay. So to summarize, the six things I think you should be considering is who is the instrument for? Who are you going to be disturbing? What time are you looking to practice? Where are you looking to put the instrument? Does it fit the space? And lastly, don't neglect the used instruments. Some real bargains will be picked up there. Then you've got my list of essentials. Make sure it's touch sensitive, weighted keys, sustained pedal. If you can get 88 keys, great. And then my last top tip is get a professional, get your teachers to come with you when you're purchasing or trying out the instruments. Okay, I hope you found something useful there. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, as I said, please leave me a comment below. Please like the video, subscribe if you found something useful. And I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.